Welcome to the EMMA meeting. We're here today uh, talking about minimal residual disease, and I'm joined today by wonderful colleagues who will be discussing the expertise on minimal residual disease. My name is Irene Gabriel. I'm from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, and I have with me here Bruno Pavia. He's from University of Navarra, Pamplona, Spain, and of course, Dr. Hervé Aveloiseau from the University of Toulouse in Toulouse, France. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. So we just heard about minimal residual disease and all of the uh, discussions that we have about minimal residual disease. Before I start, maybe you can explain to us uh, what are the classifications, because it's so confusing these days. What do you use when you say MRD positive or negative disease, and how do you classify those patients? Do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, by MRD, one understands it's uh, a very low amount of disease that is not detected by conventional methods, those methods that are available almost everywhere and therefore that's why they are in the classic response criteria. So it's the disease that stays, uh, that persists among patients with uh, complete re incomplete remission. And uh, this has been typically detected by immunophenotypic as well as molecular methods. These have evolved over time they have become more sensitive and therefore also the definitions of what is MRD positive and negative have also evolved. And in fact, these have been different as we have, uh, as they have been performed by different techniques among, uh, um, again, different cooperative groups as well as clinical trials. While this is natural because there was lack of consensus and everyone was almost doing their own method, Fortunately, and given the emerging role and uh, greater interest on MRD in the myeloma field, the Myeloma Working Group, the International Myeloma Working Group, has suggested last year in an important paper published in Lancet Oncology, uh, very well-defined criteria of what MRD negative means according to the technique, and that's why we have an MRD negative by sequencing, another by flow, another by imaging, so per technique and also the method that should be used for each one of those assessments. So for molecular is the standard NGS uh, approach, the lymphocyte. For flow is uh, the Euroflow standard operation protocols. And for imaging is PET-CT. And I know that the working group is working very hard to come out also with a consensus approach for a complete PET-CT standardization. I think that we all agree this is an important, it's not the last one, but it's an important first step towards um, uh, well-defined methods and criteria for MRD assessment. So Hervé, there's a lot of controversy. I mean, Bruno just told us what are the criteria that we use, yet not everyone is agreeing on it. Can you tell us a little bit about that and why? I don't think there is uh, such a controversy because uh, what we do agree is that we need to reach the lowest level of minimal residual disease. So in the consensus paper, uh, the cutoff has been set up at at least 10 to minus 5. If we can achieve 10 to minus 6, it is probably better. After for the technology, uh, both technology NGS or next generation flow is probably a equivalent as soon as we are achieving this low level of uh, minimal residual disease. And so I don't think uh, uh, we have to put uh, uh, the two techniques in front of them because I think they are probably the same, some advantage for one, some disadvantage for the other. But at the end of the day, probably it's the same. And what is important for the future is really to show that minimal residual disease is a surrogate marker for PFS, it is obvious, and also for overall survival. Right, and that's again, where is, where is the next step? What do you both envision as the next step of using MRD to truly use it in the standard of care for our patients so that the next time we talk here in Vienna, we will say we've been using MRD disease? Well, I, I think it's still very preliminary and uh, early to talk about MRD as a part of standard of care and certainly very, very preliminary to use MRD to tailor patients' treatment. I think that it can be safely used, again, providing that 
and this is really not discussing about one method or the other, but really adoption of either method, but uh, to really promote for all the other centers and, uh, and hospitals to adhere as much as possible to the methods that have been suggested by the International Myeloma Working Group, because these are believed as the most optimal and validated and standardized methods. This being said, it has been, it has been uh, performed for many years now in the routine setting, because it might be informative, but it's very preliminary to use it as for a marker to tailor treatment. Therefore, I believe that the next steps are really to use these standardized methods, accepted methods, in clinical trials that whenever possible it would be of interest to include variations in the design of the trial according to MRD. Either MRD stratification prior a treatment randomization or even treatment randomization according to the MRD status. So I think that the next steps are still clearly inside the clinical trials. So Hervé, a patient comes to you and is MRZ negative. Would you change therapy versus a patient who's MRZ positive? Same treatment, same cytogenetic and fish abnormalities, exactly the same biology, if you want to say, but now differences in MRZ. What would you do? No, I, I definitely agree with Bruno. Uh, so far, it, we have to show in clinical trials that we can or it is uh, good for the patients to tailor the treatment according to MRD. So far, I would not stop a treatment because the patient is MRD negative. For example, in the Pollux and Castor trial, some patients did achieve uh, MRD negativity as soon as the third si uh, cycle of chemotherapy. Definitely, we don't have to stop this time. And even in patients treated with high dose chemotherapy, I would not say this patient after bone marrow transplant is negative, I will not give him uh, or her uh, consolidation or maintenance. Definitely we have to ask this kind of question in clinical trials. So you're designing the trials now, both of you design big trials, and the question is truly how are you putting MRD into it and what else can we use? Can we use liquid biopsies? Can you use uh, higher sensitivity, better methods in the future? And will you really tailor therapy, at least in clinical trials, maybe in the future standard of care based on MRD? Well, on behalf of the Spanish myeloma group, I believe that we always had this perception that uh, the patients that are benefiting the most from the more intensive treatment strategies are the ones with a favorable biology and a good prognosis. So with this in mind, uh, our current approach on MRD-based or MRD-adapted clinical trials is certainly at the very end of the clinical trial or the treatment algorithm of the myeloma patient. So if there is any question, and typically I would say the questions are now related, for example, to the duration of maintenance, if maintenance is in the clinical trial, so the questions are being made at the end after the patient is offered the best uh, or the possible um, uh, in induction and consolidation approaches. Again, I think that uh, first we really need to show that, that MRD negative patients have the best possible outcome without stopping treatment and only at the very end stage eventually if a reduction could be um, feasible without jeopardizing the patient outcome. So very, very safe questions at the very end of the, tr of the treatment algorithm. It's true that um, as the treatment becomes, the duration of treatment becomes larger and larger, the continuous assessment of MRD in the bone marrow becomes less appealing, I would say both for the patient as well as the physician. And that's why also the interest on minimally invasive methods to monitor for MRD. I would say that unfortunately, with the techniques that we have currently available, it's not feasible in the peripheral blood. It may, it may render some false negative results and therefore the bone marrow should be considered as the standard specimen to assess MRD with ultra sensitivity. Yeah, okay. The question, I think, is more for you than for us, because <laughs> you, you did clearly show that uh, looking at uh, circulating free DNA in the blood, we can detect uh, the copy number abnormalities, we can detect the mutations. Uh, the question now is that 
could we or will we be able to use blood in the future with sequencing, with I don't know what, to be able to monitor the residual disease? In other words, do we have a correlation between the tumor burden in the bone marrow and the tumor burden we are able to detect in the blood? So I don't know if you have the answer. No, I don't have the answer yet, but I think this is where all those collaborations would be. Uh, in our data, we were just seeing, indeed, the correlation between the tumor fraction in the circulating free DNA and the MGAS or smoldering myeloma. But I absolutely agree whether circulating free DNA can be used as an MRD measurement and adding to the deeper sensitivity that we have already. And if so, it would be wonderful because it's a liquid biopsy and that's much easier for our patients and also for us to monitor sequentially those patients. So that could be something we can come up with so that the next time we talk about it more in details. So I'd like to thank, of course, both of you. Uh, this is a wonderful time for us to think of minimal residual disease in multiple myeloma, and hopefully it will be applied in the future for our patients. Thank you.